Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm exhausted already. Buenos dias. Zakuchi. <laughs> Zakuchi. Uh, in all languages, uh, we welcome you to At the Crossroads, Humanitarianism, Medicine, and Anthropology in Latin America. I'm Bonnie Taub. And I'm Reza Jarhi. This is otherwise known as the Bonnie and Reza Show. <laughs> a, t a, qu a term that was coined by... Kevin Tarasiano, who's not here. Who apologizes profusely that he is unable to be here today. Kevin is the director of the Latin American Institute, and most importantly, he's responsible for uh, our having met and this collaboration. So um, welcome, everyone. And uh, uh, we want to actually start by thanking Kevin Tarasiano for uh, his uh, ongoing and amazing support of our work and for uh, the Latin American Institute's uh, working grant, which enabled us to be able to put on this symposium series this year and in 2012 and 2013. We are also very grateful to uh, Professor Cindy Fan, who's here today and will be speaking with us, Vice Provost of International Studies, and uh, to Dr. Tom Coates, who is the Center for World Health's director and also a long-term supporter of this symposium series and, um, and our endeavors in general. Um, there are so many people to thank, and um, I want to make sure that I also give a special thanks to the staff at the Latin American Institute, Nancy Gomez in particular, who's been stellar, and you'll see her running around helping out, and Ashley Crane of the Center for World Health, um, who have helped make all of this happen. So um, thank you uh, for being here, and uh, thanks to all those in across campus. Um, what we do represents a north-south collaboration, and it involves both faculty, staff, and students in uh, anthropology, medicine, surgery, public health, and Latin American studies. So. Should I say something? Please. <laughs> I just want to add my thanks to uh, everyone that Bonnie mentioned, uh, and particularly to all of you who have come today, and to those of you I see some familiar faces uh, who have come over the past two years. This is the uh, sixth and final uh, seminar in this uh, sort of six-part series start that started last winter. We did three last year. This is the third of uh, this uh, year's uh, grouping. And um, without the sort of... Uh, feedback and energy that you provide, um, it's a different animal. So uh, we really appreciate your uh, taking your time out of your schedules, your personal lives, your professional lives to, to contributing to this uh, effort. And it's been really rewarding for the two of us, starting really from nothing, to see how uh, uh, with just a little nidus, this, uh, we're, we're part of this groundswell of interest in, in global health that's going on not only in, uh, on UCLA campus, but throughout Los Angeles and throughout the nation. Absolutely, and I want to also give a very <laughs> special thank you to uh, Diego Jaramillo, the Consulate General of Ecuador in Los Angeles. Uh, we are very honored by your presence, and we are thrilled that you're here. Estamos muy agradecidos por la presencia del Consulado de Ecuador, Diego Jaramillo. Muchas gracias por estar aquí. So, so without further ado, let's next? get this show on the road, right? Da, 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 uh, da, da. We have no music, so I'm the music. Okay, great. Yes, we need a jingle for this show. Um, and of course, we want to thank uh, all of our students, residents, fellows, um, who have uh, some whom are in the audience today. Uh, currently, and many who will be wandering in, uh, coming from classes, uh, because you uh, give us inspiration, uh, and we are thrilled uh, to have the extraordinary opportunity uh, to be part of UCLA and this educational endeavor here. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to um, uh, uh, have the great pleasure of introducing um, uh, the Consul General of Ecuador. Um, Mr. Diego Jaramillo, uh, who I think fairly recently arrived in Ecuador, and yet he hit the ground running. Uh, he um, is enthusiastic, he's intelligent, he's uh, brought with him 
uh, both the inspiration of his government as well as uh, the consulate from Washington who was here in the spring who met with uh, some of us in the medical center and in the International Institute and um, he uh, is uh, very uh, gracious to be here today to say a few words uh, welcoming everyone on behalf of Ecuador. So, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con su lado. Estamos honrados por su presencia y me da mucho honor que va a hacer algunas palabras aquí con nosotros. Y tenemos un estudiante de Ecuador, doctorado, estudiante de Kevin Terraciano. Uh, we have an Ecuadorian a doctoral student from history, Kevin's student, Ahmed, who's graciously offered to help come up and translate. So if Ahmed and the consulate, and we also have the Secretary of Ecuador, Maria, who's here, and we're very pleased and uh, honored by your presence as well. So let's welcome uh, Consul Jaramillo. Good morning uh, for my government and for the consulate of Ecuador. It's an honor to address to you today at the important symposium. I apologize for my the liberal English uh, skill, and that is why to will be using my mother language and the importance to the, the data in this in this event. El gobierno el gobierno del Ecuador eh, está guiado por su constitución del 2008. The Ecuadorian government is guided by the new constitution that was promulgated in 2008. El Ecuador es un estado constitucional de derechos y de justicia. Ecuador is a nation of democracy, freedom, mm -hmm. and rights for all its citizens. Y el deber primordial del estado, el deber primordial del estado es garantizar sin ningún tipo de discriminación los derechos establecidos en la Constitución. Therefore, the state has to grant all rights for all its citizens. Derechos fundamentales como los de la salud, tema que hoy nos ocupa. Fundamental rights such as health, the theme, the theme that we're talking about today. El más alto deber del Estado, entonces, es respetar y hacer respetar los derechos garantizados en la Constitución de la República. The state, therefore, has to grant all the rights that are in the Constitution to all its citizens. La salud, it's, more, its most important task. La salud es un derecho cuya realización vincula a otros ejercicios de derechos. Health is a right that links with other rights that are granted in the Constitution. Como el agua, la alimentación, la educación. Such as water, education, and the opportunity of being well fed. La cultura física, el trabajo, y la naturaleza. Physical education, work, and nature. Es importante comentar que nuestra constitución asigna derechos a la naturaleza. It is very important to notice that the Ecuadorian constitution grants rights to nature. El Estado garantiza este derecho mediante políticas públicas. The Ecuadorian government grants these rights by means of políticas públicas. Uh, politi uh, public policy. Políticas económicas. Economic policies. Sociales. Social policies. Ambientales. Environmental policies. Educacionales. And educational policies. Estas políticas se materializan a través de programas, proyectos y planes. All these policies come to realize by means of different projects. Todo esto convoca o crea un ambiente para crear lo que nosotros llamamos el buen vivir. All these projects and the new constitution, the, the rights that the Ecuadorian government is trying to create for the Ecuadorians now, brings together the notion of buen vivir. The summa causae, which also is, the, is a very broad, in a broad sense, is the idea of the living well, in a, in a very broad sense. Living well es un concepto, es un sueño, es un futuro, en constante construcción. El buen vivir is a dream, is something that is being constructed every day. Con este antecedente quisiera pasar a exhibir algunos datos puntuales sobre salud. 
Now that we understand this, we're going to go to talk about health uh, data about Ecuador. Es importante para nosotros evidenciar. It is important to notice for us los cambios que venimos dando la inversión social entre el año 2006 y, dos, y 2013 creció tres veces. It, it is very important to notice the changes that the Ecuadorian government with its current uh, president and government uh, has, has done in Ecuador in the last uh, years from 2006 when President Rafael Correa came into office till 2013. So we, we'll see that uh, the, the, the investment in, in social investment grew about six times. La pobreza medida por ingresos redujo 13 puntos. The poverty uh, out of uh, ingresos. I forgot. Give me a second. No importa la pobreza. The level of poverty uh, diminished in 13, 13%. La extrema pobreza se redujo en 8%. Extreme poverty reduced in 8%. Dejaron de ser pobres en Ecuador alrededor de un millón de personas. A million people in Ecuador left the lowest level of poverty. Estos son los resultados que se obtienen cuando uno tiene como principio y fin al hombre. These are the results when the, the government takes care of men more than money. Cuando entiende a la naturaleza y al hombre en una simbiosis única. When the people and Naturaleza. When, when people and nature are understood together as one uh, biotic thing, together. Las relaciones de poder en Ecuador han cambiado, permitiendo tener estos resultados. The relations of power in Ecuador have changed. That's, this is the reason why you can see these, these changes in, in all these years. La inversión total en salud en el 2013 fueron dos millones, dos mil millones de dólares. Total investment in health in Ecuador for 2013 is $2 billion. 40 millones de consultas médicas. 40, 40 million uh, people have gone to, to, the, to, to the doctors. 130 mil millones de dólares en equipos médicos. 130,000 uh, million uh, uh, medical equipment. 276 mil millones de dólares en medicinas y productos farmacéuticos. 276,000 million dollars invested in medicines and pharmaceutical products. Las cifras son muy interesantes. Sin embargo, tenemos muchas cosas que seguir haciendo. Our data is very interesting, but still we have a lot of things to do. La tasa de mortalidad general Mortality rate entre el 2000 y el 2010 from 2000 to 2010 no ha sido impactada mayormente como pueden ver. Hasn't changed too much in the last 10 years. La tasa de mortalidad materna maternal mortality rate es un tema pendiente para nosotros. It's something that the Ecuador government still has to do or deal with. La tasa de mortalidad infantil children mortality ha tenido un aceptable Desarrollo. Has improved a little. La cobertura y calidad de salud In general, Ecuadorian health se ha duplicado. Has, du uh, has become double for Ecuadorian citizens. Los resultados son muy entusias entusiastas para nosotros. All these results are very enthusiastic for the Ecuadorian government and the people. Pero la verdad no son suficientes. Yet this is not enough. Otros datos de importancia some other uh, data that is important to mention. Y por los que estoy aquí este día. And the reasons why I'm here. Para tratar de buscar relaciones transparentes. To find good relations, clear relations between us and. Beneficios us. mutuos. Something beneficial for, the, for, for both of us. Es para pedir ayuda para atacar estos problemas que aún no lo hemos podido resolver. Is to ask for help and support in certain, in certain uh, specific things that we have not covered yet. Por ejemplo, la incidencia de la diabetes. For example, the case of diabetes. Entre el año 2000 y el 2009. From 2000 to 2009. Se ha disparado terriblemente. It has increased 
deeply, ter terribly. Igual la hi hi hipertensión arterial. Likewise, arterial hypertension. Son temas que nos preocupan mucho. Son temas que necesitamos ayuda y colaboración. These topics really bother us and we foster and look for some support. Las enfermedades crónicas se encuentran entre las primeras causas de muerte en mi país. Chronic diseases are one of the, the top uh, reasons of death in Ecuador. Las enfermedades cardiovasculares representan el 30% de las muertes en Ecuador. Cardiovascular disease represents 30% of all deaths in Ecuador. Tenemos muchas cosas pendientes aún. We still have a lot of things to do. Los, es, los esfuerzos en salud en Ecuador han sido impresionantes. All the efforts in Ecuador have been really impressive, but still have to do some more. Pero como repito, no son suficientes. Yet we still need to do some more. Con este antecedente, da la pauta eh, para forjar acuerdos de colaboración, de acompañamiento con la academia, con la universidad, para buscar una hoja de ruta en la que podamos beneficiarnos mutuamente. Knowing these circumstances in Ecuador, we're here to try to get some agreements in, in a base of mutual respect. Recognizing our own interests as well as your interests, trying to create spaces for good uh, relationships between us, support and collaboration. Necesitamos de todo el conocimiento y la tecnología posible. We all need. We need all the knowledge that you you may give us in academia and in the U.S. in general. Pero sobre todo de la buena fe y la solidaridad. But most important of all, solidarity and your goodwill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Council Jaramillo. Estamos muy agradecidos por sus palabras y por la información que nos ha dado sobre su país eh, y sobre, uh, eh, más que nada, por su intención de, de dar la mano a nosotros, de, de tener interés en lo que estamos haciendo aquí en la academia y ojalá que podemos uh, continuar el diálogo. We're so grateful for your uh, fine words to learn more about Ecuador and uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, we congratulate you on the uh, impressive changes that have been taking place, both socially and uh, medically and health-wise, of the Ecuadorian population as an example uh, uh, in Latin America, and also uh, for your ongoing uh, efforts here uh, at the university to uh, be interested in what we do and also to continue the dialogue of, of hopefully uh, future work together. So thank you so much. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Cindy Fan, who is uh, the Vice Provost of International Studies. Um, and uh, Cindy is a multi-talented individual and we are extraordinarily um, lucky to have her at the helm of the international uh, efforts, the universities in efforts to reach out to the world, really, no less. Um, and um, while her uh, job as Vice Provost um, started uh, more uh, domestically, shall we say, to engage all the centers and the programs uh, that, uh, that uh, train uh, students internationally, now her, her role has expanded. Perhaps we'll hear more about that. Um, uh, but she is a professor of geography and, um, and Asian American studies, uh, and she um, has uh, uh, done some uh, groundbreaking work on labor migration, on marriage migration, spatial and social inequality, gender and cities in China. And uh, so she is a scholar in her own right, um, having been funded uh, by uh, the National Science Foundation and many other illustrious uh, organizations. And uh, she has uh, written numerous publications which are uh, significant in her field. And she's here today uh, to say a few words and welcome everyone on behalf of the Institute um, and uh, has been um, uh, instrumental in, I think, uh, everyone, uh, myself uh, as chair of Latin American Studies and all my colleagues, uh, to be more uh, engaged uh, uh, with um, the potential for innovative collaborations globally, as well as uh, what we care so much about, which is education of our students. So welcome, Cindy Fan, and thank you for being here.
Thank you, Bonnie, for this very generous introduction and um, such a privilege to be on the Bonnie and Reza show. <laughs> um, it's an honor to, to be giving uh, brief opening remarks uh, for this very exciting symposium. And um, last year, I was uh, also uh, in one of the um, symposia. So I learned that this is the third year that this series, second the second year, okay. Um, it feels like it's the third year. It feels like an enterprise already, right? <laughs> and um, one of the first things I'd like to draw attention to is, is the visuals. You know, the, the bookmark here, which shows, I think, um, some of the uh, images that uh, you had used in previous symposia. As, as a geographer, I love seeing maps, and I'm so uh, happy to see uh, the map, uh, a globe, being used as one of the images for this particular symposium. But also as a geographer, I am always very interested in seeing how people and place are being connected. And I think this is the spirit of this enterprise that Bonnie and Reza have so effectively put together, is to marry the people and the place. And um, I'm happy to see that this is a multi-year effort, because with uh, multi-year um, activities, you're seeing commitment as well as continuity. And there's a lot of traction into what you're doing already. I see articles in, at UCLA Today, of course, on the International Institute website, but also the U Magazine of the School of um, Medicine. And these are all indications of the traction that uh, symposia like, like, like these are, are now cultivating. I also wanted to congratulate Bonnie and uh, Reza for building this model of engaging faculty and students from North Campus and South Campus. And to the visitors to UCLA, North Campus is usually, usually sort of um, associated with social sciences, humanities, and the arts. And the South Campus is usually associated with the sciences and medicine and, and so on. But this is a very unique model that really helps integrate the various disciplines and the various constituencies of, of the campus together in one place, in one, um, in one sort of endeavor. And the funding of, um, that you've been so creatively secured also is bearing fruits because of these uh, multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. So the funding from the uh, UCLA Latin American Institute through the Title VI um, effort a Title VI grant from the U.S. Department of Education, the funding from the UCLA Center for World Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Tom Coates. And also, I know that you've also received funding from the UCLA Clinical and Translational Science Institute grant. So congratulations for all these successful efforts. This is also a very effective way of engaging the community on behalf of academia. So uh, very, very pleased to have met Council General of Ecuador, Diego Jaramillo, this morning. Thank you for coming to campus and giving us um, the opening remarks. Um, finally, I wanted to just mention that this is an extremely effective way to advance the university's global reach and mission. UCLA's global strategy is multifaceted, and of course it involves international research, collaboration, and working on pressing problems that are facing peoples worldwide. But when I was reading Bonnie and Rez, Reza's work in Guatemala in particular, I've also been struck by the quality and the broader impacts of, of their work. When they talked about leaving the comfort zone, uh, when they talked about cultural sensitivity and humility, when they talked about the personal connections that they've had with the, but with the patients, with the, with the community um, in local, local areas, when you talked about indigenous communities, building bridges with them, when you talked about learning from the patients, all these experiences reminded me of this notion of global citizenship. This notion is used very widely now, but rarely um, have I seen definitions and actually concrete examples of what global citizenship is about. So may I draw your attention to a, um, a work by Sheila Biddle in the late 1990s when she studied internationalization of five U.S. research universities. 
she came up with the following four attributes of global citizen, of a global citizen. This is someone who has the literacy, consciousness, and a critical understanding of how national and international issues intersect. That was number one. Number two, a global citizen is someone who has an awareness of their role in an interdependent world and how they could contribute to shape and improve it. Thirdly, a global citizen is someone who has the capacity and commitment backed by research and experience to solve problems as members of a global society. And finally, and I would say this is the most important, and that is a global citizen is someone who has the humility about their own biases. And so I think what Bonnie and Reza and all of you are doing today really exemplifies what global citizenship is about. And you are role models for our students because you are the practitioners, you are also the communicators, you are also actively advocating you know, for reaching out, connecting with people worldwide, solving problems, improving the world. So for that, I really want to congratulate you and I very much take pride in being part of this enterprise and best wishes for this very successful conference. And again, congratulations. Cindy, thank you so much. It's, it's really humbling to, uh, I was going to say humiliating, but <laughs> <laughs> humbling to, uh, to receive those words of, uh, those complimentary words and the words of encouragement. Um, and I've, I've, t you know, I've told Bonnie from the very start of our uh, friendship and relationship that um, you know, she's far smarter than me. Uh, um, because um, someone told me once I, recently that I shouldn't use the term dumb surgeon. I like to describe myself as a dumb surgeon. You know, um, you know Federico laughs. Because <laughs> you're a smart surgeon, I'm a dumb surgeon. <laughs> um, but uh, but <clears throat> one of the things that I've loved about this series is <clears throat> just my my uh, the insights I've picked up from other people, the perspectives I've picked up from other people, and it's certainly made me more um, more insightful about what I do uh, because of it. Because uh, people use different words to describe this, this uh, the same circumstance, so I use sort of maybe cut and dry scientific surgical language, and, and, and anthropologists will use much more eloquent uh, language, and uh, and I learn from that, and and uh, so it's humbling, but also I'm an opportunist, so. Um, when you talk about global citizen, it makes me think of Tom Coates, who, who I'm going to um, just spend a second introducing. Um, few people know this, but uh, Tom Coates uh, started as a potato farmer in uh, Idaho. Um, no, that's not him. I, was <laughs> I thought maybe in another world you could have been a potato farmer. Um, you know, I, I've introduced Tom a couple times before at, the, at some of our symposia, and the, the, we don't have time for me to go over this list of accomplishments. Um, they're all here, um, and, and I'm not going to read them. And if you just Google him, there's 10,000 articles on him. Or if you look at the websites on the on the uh, on the various UCLA uh, pages, uh, Center for World Health, and others, um, you can read about all of his awards and his uh, research awards and his teaching awards and his contributions to education. But um, what I what I so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by very many people I meet um, uh, because uh, it seems I meet every day someone who has a significant degree of commitment and engagement and expertise in whatever field they're in. And I'm impressed by that. I'm, I'm impressed by excellence and accomplishment. Um, but I'm not necessarily in awe of a lot of people. And Tom is someone who I've come to be in awe of uh, in the very brief time I've gotten to know him uh, uh, over the last year or so. And the reason why is because what we've discovered through this uh, symposia series is that there is something uh, in the ether, I've said that before from the stage, there's something in the ether that we seem to be reaching a, a tipping point here where there's so many different uh, types of people from different, who come from different backgrounds who are interested in uh, world health and global medicine. And they're from North Campus and South Campus, and Bonnie and I happen to meet each other in the middle, and so we're you know, trying to create some sort of bridges between these communities. But, um, but uh, um, Tom came to UCLA and very quickly 
uh, has become identified as the leader in this field on campus. Um, and I think that's not only impressive, but awesome. Not the way my kids say awesome, dude, but uh, just very awe-inspiring. And we were just talking before, and, and, uh, and I was paying him a compliment in a typical self-deprecating, self-effacing way. He said, well, you're doing all the work. And that's not true at all. I, uh, I, you know, I, I do describe myself as a grunt. A lot of surgeons are. You know, we're just hands-on. We like to go there and do the work. And, but we can't do those things. We, I cannot go overseas unless there's someone somewhere who's, who's had a greater vision and organized uh, uh, an infrastructure for me to go and provide. I can't just get on a plane and go with a, a bag of surgical tools and, and ply my craft. I need a visionary who's in the leadership position to do that, and Tom's been doing that all over the world. So when Cindy talks about global citizen, I, I the the first thing that comes to mind is is Tom Coates. You know, he had some um, <laughs> humble beginnings <laughs> in academia, and he went through his. Uh, I do this. I've done this to Bonnie and Kevin, the very first one. So now you have to take it. Um, then he had his uh, you know his GQ phase. <laughs> um, and now he's just the, the Tom Coates who we all know and love and uh, is, is leading the charge and we're all uh, following his, his great example. So, uh, Tom, thank you for coming and please uh, welcome. Well, Reza, you showing those pictures makes me think that I might need um, the assistance of some of your colleagues in plastic surgery. <laughs> <laughs> family discount, Reza, family discount. I uh, thank you, Reza. You're 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 way too kind, way 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 too kind. You know, actually, I could have been a potato farmer. Um, my um, grandparents got on the boat late 1800s, and they were potato farmers. And of course, it was the potato famine, and they came to Chicago. Uh, they uh, came actually initially as indentured servants, and then got their freedom when they were 21 and got married and. Uh, finished eighth grade, and they thought that was an accomplishment. And my mother's greatest regret was that she was not allowed to go to college. She wanted to go to university in the worst way, and her mother said, no, you're going to finish high school and get a secretarial uh, degree and uh, have a practical skill. So I think the moment I came out of the womb, my mother said to me, you're going to get your education. You're going to get your college education. And, uh, and it stuck. And I feel like uh, we're the fortunate ones. Um, Muchas gracias, Consul Jaramillo, for su presentación. What's happening in Ecuador is happening all over the world. We were graced early, late in 2013 with the visit from the ambassador to the United States from Ecuador. And uh, we would look forward to talking to you further about other potential collaborations. What's happening in Ecuador is very, very inspiring. But what's happening there is happening in many places around the world. Uh, we, we launched the Center for World Health with a report out of the Lancet called Global Health 2035. And the report makes a very, very important point, and that is in the late 1800s, Sweden and China had similar longevity rates. It was in the 40s to 50 range. And then in the 1900s, Sweden's longevity rate grew till about 75 to 80, what's sort of natural and normal now in the Scandinavian countries. China's did not. However, in the last 20 years, they've converged. So that life expectancy in China is the same as life expectancy in Sweden, is the same as life expectancy in Mexico, is the same as life expectancy in the United States. This is what they call the grand convergence. And so our task for the next 20 years is the countries that have not yet reached that kind of life expectancy, that's the task. And it's achievable. And that's what's exciting. And that's what we're about today. In, in the launch of the Center for World Health, we took as our byline, saving lives and improving health by investing in people. I had the really nice fortune this last weekend uh, to spend time with my family. I have two brothers, one in Washington State and one in uh, Northern California. And my brother in Northern California has two children and they each have two children. And 
my sister, my niece's children are 11 and 8, and my nephew's children are 2 and, you know, less than one year. And I was reflecting on a conversation I had with one of our pediatricians who works as a hospitalist at Ronald Reagan. UCLA Medical Center, and I said to her, how do you do the work that you do? Because you're dealing with very sick kids. And then I was reflecting, visiting with my family, that all of my grandnieces and nephews are really healthy. And one of the very important moments of life for everyone is the birth of their children and the birth of other children in their family. And you really want them to be healthy and well and to prosper and to have all the opportunities and all the chances. And what's happening in Ecuador is giving more of those children chances. We had the good fortune at the launch of the Center for World Health of uh, uh, one of our speakers was Dr. Richard Horton, who is the editor of The Lancet. And he wrote a commentary that appeared in the April 24th issue of The Lancet. And he called the UCLA Center for World Health the best that America has to offer. And as I was looking down the, the list of speakers here, uh, Dr. Velez, Dr. Weisner, Dr. Levy, Dr. Jarahi, Dr. Taub, and maybe Dr. Cutrus, who's one of our alum, um, but who doesn't have plans to return here, but maybe someday we can get you back here. Uh, this is the best of what America has to offer because you're all highly skilled people dedicating your time to improving the lives of children. And improving the lives of those children, you're improving the lives of their families and improving the lives of their communities and giving more and more children a chance to have a good life. And that's really what we're all about. So I think that one of the things we often think about is how different we are around the world. But we're also very, we also have a lot of commonalities. And one of those things is we do care about our children. We do care about our families. And one of the things I'm proud about at UCLA is that we care about the world. And I think it's evidenced by the remarkable work that our surgeons and anthropologists do and our collaborations around the world because this is the way we can grow together and really reach that grand convergence so that everyone in the world, everyone in Los Angeles County, has the same opportunities and the same opportunity for a good and bountiful and happy life. So thank you very much for doing this. Now I talk. <laughs> Thank goodness for Bonnie, because I say, Bonnie, now what happens? <laughs> and she says, now you talk. <laughs> you may have. I don't think there was many. I think I just wrote Global Citizen. <laughs> I can give my talk with these three uh, photos uh, up there if you want. I thought you were going to talk about me some more. I'd like to. <laughs> I, can, I can talk about it for a long time. There they are. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, uh, brevity is a soul of wit, and I'm not witty. Well, actually, I can, I can hang with some conversationalists. But um, I'm, I'm going to be brief. I, I, uh, I've given five talks at the previous five symposia, and um, 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 I focused on you know, my experience in, with the intersection between uh, surgery, in my case, medicine, uh, healthcare delivery in the developing nations, and the cultural aspects and the anthropological aspects. Uh, and uh, I was going to sort of just uh, make a few adjustments and give a version of the talk that uh, uh, the talks that I've given. Um, and then I realized that uh, uh, things come to me maybe a little later than most people. I realize that we're uh, here, uh, the theme of today is humanitarianism. Uh, so I didn't think uh, just another talk on surgery would be apt or the most uh, 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 suitable uh, thing to do. And certainly if, for those of you who have seen, uh, come to a couple of our symposia, you tune out more than usual. Uh, there he goes with this talk again about you know, the garden and the parachute and all that. So um, I was wondering what I would do, um, and I started thinking about, you know, what is humanitarianism? Because I've been called a humanitarian before, and so I'm not humanitarian, I'm a surgeon. I said, well, but, 
but I, I'm, I'm interested in humanitarian efforts. Going overseas and doing volunteer work like this is a humanitarian effort. Um, it's humanistic. In other words, there's a, it's a focus on, on humanism and, and, and treating human beings and seeing them as human beings and not just patients, which is something that uh, maybe physicians are uh, guilty of and certainly surgeons can fall into that trap. Oh, the cholecystitis in room four. Oh, the cleft lip in room seven. We sort of compartmentalize our patients into their diagnoses and there's a little bit, there can be a disconnect between um, the, the human qualities of our patients and, and, and what we're focused on, i.e. their diagnoses. Um, and, uh, but of course, we, we as uh, caregivers, we try and be humane to all of our patients and, and show compassion. And, and ultimately, I realize that uh, to be a humanitarian is to just to, to be, to focus on what it means to be human. And in my personal experience, and what drives me is just to uh, find the humanity in others, not, which in my case may be related to a cleft lip or palate, but maybe to something greater than that, because that certainly doesn't define the people that I'm treating. That, that is why they come to me, and that's how the, the, the situation in which I meet them. But, um, but, but my purpose may be not to just focus on that, but to focus on something more. So, so how, how am I going to do that, um, specifically for this audience and this presentation? I came home to this last night. Um, my wife, uh, dark slide, but my wife is doing what she does every night, and she's reading to my, my boys The Hunger Games, <laughs> yeah. which, uh, you know, I'm not sure my 10-year-old twin boys need to, you know, hear about kids killing each other, uh, maybe a little too young for that, but in any event, there they love the story, and, and, uh, and what my wife was doing last night, what she does every night, and what I try and do when I get home on time, is what all human beings do. We are, what, one of the things that, the, you know, we eat, we drink, we seek shelter, and we tell stories. I mean, that is what, uh, what I sort of, I had this aha moment, sort of an epiphany, realized last night that the thing that defines us as humans is that we are storytellers. And, and I got very excited about this. I thought I, I was brilliant. <laughs> um, that, you know, no one has ever thought of this idea that humans are, what, def what makes us humans is our storytelling ability. And then I went online <laughs> and realized a lot, <laughs> a lot of smart people have thought of this before for hundreds of years. So I, I'm just coming a little bit late to the party. Um, you know, Khalil Gibran, it has been said that next to hunger and thirst, our most basic human need is for storytelling or John Didion, we tell our, ourselves stories in order to live. Storytelling is a fundamental part of our existence, and it always has been. If you go back to you know, the earliest Homo sapiens, the cavemen, they, they told their histories through cave drawings, that's stories. And we tell stories through music, and we tell, uh, before there was the, the printing press, we told our oral stories. And you know, all the religions uh, emanate from an oral uh, storytelling tradition. So. So I said, well, I, I'm going to talk about humanitarianism through storytelling because I have some experience in storytelling. This thing keeps going off. Um, I, I tell stories too, and I always have in my career. They've been very focused. It's been a very focused story. I can tell you the story of the anatomy of a cleft lip. What are the, what's the story of this child from developing in utero and what the genetic potential reasons for this is, the environmental causes of this. There's a story behind a child developing a cleft lip and palate. And then there's a story behind this operation that I do. I didn't create it, someone else did. I can tell you the surgeon and that history and that story. And, and I do tell this, I, I can tell the story of why some children are born without ears and how we can take rib cartilage and make an ear and give a child with a, with a deformity and make him look more normal, so to speak, and make him look like the other kids in his class. And I tell these stories to the people I work with. This is uh, um, in the operating room in Guatemala last year, and I'm having a discourse with my resident and the onlookers. And we're, we're uh, you know, my job there as an educator, as someone who works in the university setting, is to educate. But what is education? It's, it's telling stories that are meant to teach someone something about a specific topic. So, 
So, so I'm, I'm very humanistic in that way. I'm a, I'm a career storyteller. But I realize that my, the, the realm of my storytelling, my subject matter is pretty limited to this. But really, um, this, is pretty, uh, this is pretty focal. This is pretty specific. Whereas from a more global standpoint, these are the stories that people relate to, the stories of their lives. And if I think about my experience overseas, the stories that I've been engaged in have been focused on medicine. And over the past few years, as some of you know from the slides I've shown, I've been more and more interested in improving my storytelling ability in medicine by engaging in the stories of people's lives, the people that I meet. So, you know, if I were to become a better storyteller, or even more importantly, a better listener of other people's stories, would that make me a better surgeon? Would it make me a better humanitarian? Would it make me a better human being? And, um, and so, there, so the focus now for me is a little different when I go overseas. So this gentleman here is a Guatemalan doctor who's sitting right there, um, who uh, we met, he, uh, at the site that, one of the sites that I go to overseas in Guatemala, um, Dr. Segovia used to come and volunteer his time as a translator just to help the team out during the week. And, and it was a couple of years ago we met and I said, well, this is a very interesting thing because here's a, a guy who could be out there, you know, doing something, trying to make money, but he's volunteering his time to help his people. He had a very deep connection to what we were doing as visitors to his country. And so we just sort of brought him in on the team so he can help us not only translate literally, but also provide some sort of bridge behind, you know, who is this woman and her child? Fine, her child has a cleft lip. I know that story, but I want to know more about this patient's background. And Andres can tell me about her. What, what, what are the significance of these patterns and colors? Because in Guatemala, the textiles are, are indicative of a certain uh, uh, regional uh, history and tradition. Um, and this is me in my sort of storytelling capacity, talking to a patient's mother about the surgery I'm going to perform. And this is a child whose palate I'm going to fix. I'm just in my broken Spanish. I'm trying to demonstrate to her that I'm going to bring the two sides of the palate on either side together. And I, I'll tell you that in the overseas, this is sort of a sine qua non in, in the U.S. You have to talk to your patients before and after surgery. But I have seen, and I've been guilty of this, where overseas we don't necessarily spend a lot of time here. Um, we don't speak the language. The, the problems are straightforward and, and pretty well defined. So we ne don't necessarily engage with the parents. And, and so as in my endeavor to become a better storyteller over the past few years, I've been spending more time with the parents. But, um, and then here's uh, uh, Dr. Segovia in the operating room. And that's, I asked him to scrub with me on this case because it was a complicated case on the last day that we were leaving uh, Guatemala. And I needed to know what was going to happen with this patient when I left because I was reticent to do the operation, anticipating potential complications without having follow-up. In other words, I needed to know the next chapter. And once I get on that plane, I close the book. But then I found a guy who can continue reading the book and relate the story to me. And we worked together, separated by a couple thousand miles, but united through Skype or iChat or whatever. And, uh, and, and we helped finish this woman's story, and she walked out of the hospital. Um, but still, uh, Every time, the more involved I would get, the more stories I would encounter that I didn't understand. Why is this uh, one-year-old, sorry, it's still up there. I have to turn off my Wi-Fi. Why is this one-year-old child weighs six pounds. Why does this one-year-old child have the physiology of a newborn infant? Um, these are some of the things I want to know. Why did this cleft lip fall apart a week after we left Guatemala? This is a very, very uncommon occurrence. And this is a story that I don't understand. So in order to be, in order to really do what I want to do to the standard that I want to do, uh, the ethical standard, the moral standard, I need to know more about these sorts of things. And that's why I'm at these two. Bonnie, you should look at this slide. 
I like pulling up old pictures of people. <laughs> that's Kevin Terraciano and that's Bonnie Taub. And, and these two, you know, by, in, by meeting and, and uh, developing a relationship with a historian and anthropologist, I learned a whole different way of interacting with other human beings. Um, because it's very different from the surgical way. And so, uh, you know, pictures tell a story. And I, I never really looked at pictures like this. But it told me that in, in Guatemala, where I operate in Peru, in Guatemala, up to 50% of people live below the poverty line. Up to 20% of people live on a dollar a day. And so that starts to give me some context of who these people are, who these children are who are coming to my home. Um, this is, you know, what, th this is just a typical picture from the waiting room. Parents who, a, a family who's brought their child for an operation, you know, their body, you can read their body language, right? Their arms are crossed, they're sort of a little suspicious, they don't know who I am, I show up there, I don't speak their language very well. Um, the, the uncle on, the, on the, our right, you know, he's, he's sort of, you know, giving me the stare down, like, you know, uh, we're here for our, our, our child, you know, there's not trust here. We, we don't speak the same. We, we, our stories don't intersect. Um, and this is the value of having someone like Bonnie uh, be by my side, because while I'm doing the operation, she's talking to this family and, and learning about their stories and their beliefs and their fears and their concerns and what they're okay with and what makes them very uncomfortable. This is something that I never thought to do, uh, nor would I have the capacity to do. But now that uh, now that Bonnie and I have partnered and, and go overseas together, I'm, I'm so much more comfortable in the operating room knowing that this is going on outside. Um, and at the after surgery, I come, I bring the child to the recovery room, I talk to the uh, parents and say, the surgery went well, I leave, and then Bonnie goes in, and then she says, well, did you know this, 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 about, and these are the circumstances under which the child was born, and this is what they thought about the surgery? I said, no, I had no idea what. what. But, but that sort of storytelling is something that I want to be a greater part of. Um, she also spends a lot of time talking to the healthcare delivery staff. These are two of the nurses who are the bridge between the doctors and the patient's families. Bringing them in to the operating room, taking them into the recovery room, talking to the parents, giving them directions, etc., and getting their thoughts about uh, you know, where they come from, what their beliefs are, and how they translate their uh, instructions to families and parents. Um, still that's not enough, because it's still within the medical context for me. Um, because here in the States, when you, when if, and you guys have been patients, maybe, and when you go to the doctors, you fill out a form, and the doctor wants to know not only your, the history uh, of your medical illness and your surgical procedures that you've had done, but what's your social history? What kind of work do you do? Do you smoke? Do you drink? Uh, um, what's your level of education, etc. And that's something that is very foreign to me in, in this setting, uh, the overseas health setting. Um, I want to know more about where my patients come from. And every child has a story. And I was lucky enough to uh, meet people who uh, founded this NGO, Mayan Families, which is a pretty well-respected organization in Guatemala. And this is one of their kids who gets sponsored by people who donate to provide education. So, um, I can't read without bending down. This is Kenzie, and uh, she, uh, um, her dad works, makes $25 a week. Her brother had to, uh, can't go to school because he has to work with dad. Their subsistence is rice and beans, but when dad can't find work, it's tortillas and salt. Their house was uh, inundated in a mudslide and it ruined all their possessions. They used to all sleep on a bed together. Now they sleep on straw mats on the floor. And she's not one of my patients, but she very well could be. And it helps to have this sort of understanding and to know her story. Um, and that's when I started to get more involved in sort of community service. So in addition to going down doing the surgeries, uh, we'll bookend every trip with uh, uh, a story, um, uh, a community service activity. So uh, this is the lake region in, uh, uh, in Lake Atitlan. And you can see just from the homes, you can see the sort of what kind of neighborhood this is. This is a very destitute area. Um, and the people live in darkness. There's no electricity. So in the daytime, the houses are dark. And they live in pollution. So all the flashbulb picks up all those little gray dots. That's soot 
from indoor flame and they use indoor fires for uh, heating and cooking and so that little baby from the day she came home has been inhaling this smoke and that's something that made me think aha you know sometimes wound healing is affected well, wound healing is always affected by smoke inhalation so maybe some of these wound problems that we have overseas are due to this because this is an epidemic this is from clean cook stoves three billion people have internal open flames four million premature deaths not to mention all the pulmonary disease and burns and women and children are the most affected because they're the ones at home so my patients are among these three billion people um, so this is the story of how we got engaged with building stoves in people's homes. So before we do our, our surgery trip, we go a few days early we, with a small investment of money and a few days investment of time. We bring communities together. They're all pitching in and we can build in, I kid you not, 15 minutes with all these prefabricated pieces of cinder block <coughs> and ceramic, we can put a pretty fuel efficient stove in there and boom. And, and I love this picture because this girl doesn't understand the story. <laughs> she's lived her whole life with a flame and she's like, Mom, what's going on now? Tell me the story of what this big block is here and why is there fire coming out of it? The fire's usually in the corner and I should be breathing smoke. Now the smoke's going outside of the hole that they drilled in the chimney. And this woman was very uh, emotional when we <clears throat> put her stove in and she said for the first time in her life and her family's life, she was going to have tortillas that night that didn't taste like ash because they make this, you know, they ground their cornmeal and they put it on a little piece of aluminum foil on the fire where there's all the ash. So their food for their entire lives tastes like ash. And she started boiling the corn right away for that night's dinner. Um, and, and this is sort of, you know, sort of an epilogue because I think when you start engaging in, in the stories of the people that you know, you're going down to treat, that this is what the result is. Uh, the, the body language has changed, the facial expression. We're now on the same team and now we're all part of the same story as opposed to my story coming to operate and leave, their story coming suspiciously and hoping for a good outcome and leaving. This is, this is in my opinion, the ideal. And obviously, Bonnie is the uh, executor of that. And of course, it's the next generation that will continue to tell the stories, just like we're telling the stories to our kids and they'll tell them to their kids. This is uh, Bonnie, one of Bonnie's daughters, and my daughter, who came with us on the trip, who came with us to meet some of the children who live in the homes that we built stoves in. And they're going to take these stories now and tell them to their friends and their children in the future. So, so I guess my, I'm not sure what my point is because I, I made this talk between uh, midnight and 2.30 a.m., <laughs> although Dr. Velez beat me because he was <laughs> much later than that. Um, but I think uh, the importance that I've seen is um, that uh, humanitarianism for me, I think I'm discovering, means engaging in the stories that other people have to tell about our lives and how my story becomes part of theirs and theirs part of ours. And now Dr. Segovia is here doing research in my lab for the year and hoping to train here so he can go home and take his stories here and share them with his people in Guatemala. So, um, and I think that's what we're doing here today, and that's what we've done in this series, just tell stories about our experiences and share our opinions. So, so I thank you all for listening to my rambling, and um, I want to introduce Bonnie. She'll come up. The only thing I'll say about Bonnie, without making this a boring love fest, is that if you've enjoyed anything about anything here today or any of the other symposia, it's really the ratio of work that has gone into these is really about 98% Bonnie, 1% Reza. So it's really the Bonnie show and Reza. It's, it's not like the Bonnie and Reza show. So thank you for your attention. Well, clearly Reza is not a mathematician. <laughs> because he's wrong. It's not 98% to 2. It's <laughs> OK, it's not 99 either. Um, the reality is that this program, our collaboration, would not be happening if it were not for Reza and uh, for uh, all of the people that we've invited to speak, both today. Uh, Dr. Nick Cutris, who we're so honored to have with us uh, from Ayuda and uh, Miami, uh, Dr. Velez here at UCLA, Dr. Levy, Dr. Wisner. Um, and um, all of those who you heard from make remarks. 
Um, it's quite humbling to have had the opportunity to join forces with Reza. As I like to say, I'm the luckiest anthropologist on the planet because I get to work with Dr. Reza Jarahi and learn about the world of surgery and medicine, but also um, because um, he is a truly exemplary of someone who, um, who lives and breathes that um, value of humility um, and um, is exceptional in many ways. Um, uh, and one thing that you may not be aware of that I have said on previous occasions is that he's a bridge builder, a bridge maker, and that's part of why it's so exciting to work with Reza. Um, because he um, doesn't always know how we might get from point A to point B, but he um, uh, develop, he has an enthusiasm, a vision, and a passion, which um, is quite extraordinary and which also um, uh, in the field of medicine I think is rare um, because in particular he has to be so focused, his skills need to be so honed and so meticulous, and I've had the um, uh, incredible opportunity to experience this kind of humanism for myself um, in the operating room and then as you see in the waiting room both here at UCLA and abroad and um, he also uh, many of you won't know this is a scientist and um, and, and uh, maintains a very impressive uh, uh, laboratory uh, making groundbreaking discoveries and so um, I say all this because each person that has been part of our symposia has an equally impressive and exceptional record. Um, and um, whether it be the anthropologists, uh, let me move forward here in my talk, because my task uh, is to kind of uh, give you a little retrospective um, briefly of where we've been in our symposia series um, and tying all the themes together. So. Um, we um, have um, uh, had this uh, goal and this uh, idea to, uh, to start to create a dialogue um, across disciplines. Um, so this year we had uh, uh, our first symposium was on Mesoamerica, focusing on medicine and anthropology. Uh, last year's uh, first one uh, was about um, a focus on medical anthropologists. Um, and then in March, we had a focus on Brazil, and Dr. Karen Nielsen, the Center for Brazilian Studies, presented about her work on HIV, and we had uh, um, uh, a craniofacial uh, surgeon who started a clinic in Brazil come. And then lastly, today, with our focus on humanitarianism. So uh, um, I want to just very briefly um, give a few reflections uh, of where we've been at the crossroads. Um, and our work in uh, surgical anthropology, and now bringing us to the current, uh, to, to the present point, if you will, with humanitarianism. Um, so um, uh, this interdisciplinary educational symposium, much to our delight, was, as we mentioned, funded by the Latin American Institute, uh, generously supported by the Center for World Health, too, um, and uh, seems to be um, novel in the academic world for people to come together not in conferences which are specific to their academic silos. Um, and on this campus we've uh, uh, seen a lot of response both uh, in students, faculty, and others who are interested in community um, engagement. The um, numerous students have come to see both uh, uh, myself and Reza after these saying, you know, how can we get involved? We're interested in going out and having a learning experience abroad that will complement our classes, that will complement what we're learning in the operating room, both medical students and residents. And I, for the first time, I went to a surgical conference presenting one of our papers. And uh, it's a different culture in a lot of ways as an anthropologist. Um, it was really uh, intriguing, uh, a little bit uncomfortable at times, as it is when you move into you know, a new culture, but exciting as well. Um, and yet, um, ultimately, What's tied us all together is, in fact, this hunger that we do have to tell stories and learn about stories, as Reza has said, which, of course, that's what I was trained to do as an anthropologist. We're trained to be interested, to learn about, to get that insider view, that emic perspective compared to the edict outsider, that ethnographic documentation. 
and, um, and to do so uh, with a lens which is hopefully um, understanding of one's own biases, uh, prejudices, um, and um, with um, the utmost of ethics and humility. Um, so um, our, uh, our vision, if you will, of, of um, um, putting this together happened both sort of, uh, I, I would say, organically, if you, in, in a sense, in that I think we brought the best of both of our worlds together, and, um, and you know, bananas and strawberries, and now we have an amazing uh, smoothie, I'd like to say. Um, and, um, and, and so um, through the, the series, we've had visitors come who, who are running programs like the um, uh, clinicians who came in uh, January from Hospital de la Familia in, in Guatemala, which is a, an example of part of what we're interested, I think, at UCLA and across the nation, to create more sustainable programs with Americans going abroad, but working with local people. And you'll see an extraordinary example of that with the work of um, Dr. Kutchis in, um, in Latin America shortly. <clears throat> And, um, and also um, to um, engage um, both at the highest levels of the university, um, the administration, um, we have Tim Brewer, who's the vice provost now of interdisciplinary affairs, who's spearheading efforts to bring faculty together across the campus and across the UCs and beyond to have this dialogue. Should we take on global health as a grand challenge? And I've been at many meetings uh, in the last six months in Murphy Hall. Um, with regards to that. Um, and, um, and so it's exciting, as uh, Reza said, to see that these, this interest in the rest of the world, in the medical professions and legal professions too, is, um, is, uh, is, is joining what the social scientists have been doing for many years, right? In anthropology, sociology, history, et cetera, which is to learn about the context in which people live. Um, and then uh, here's the Brazilian one that I mentioned. And um, I was very touched that, that uh, Cindy um, made reference to the visuals that we've incorporated, because that's been something very important to us, to um, have a kind of a multi-media uh, um, approach to understanding. And I know from having uh, been an instructor in the classroom and being a parent that people learn in, many, in different ways sometimes. We're, visual, uh, auditory, um, and certainly the experiential is what really uh, makes it uh, so that we don't forget things. Uh, but the, the um, incredible images that we were able to um, get the permission of artists, and this one in particular is of uh, Joel Bergner, who works with youth in Brazilian favelas uh, to create this beautiful mural art and to uh, is another example of engagement, so you may not know all of their stories. Uh, they're not being told uh, directly, but sort of subconsciously and through these images, we're conveying um, that there's a wide world out there of people um, in, the, in the arts, uh, in music, which we've also incorporated in our events, as well as um, scientists. Um, and so finally then, um, where we've been is to um, start this dialogue in year one, where we had um, uh, numerous medical anthropologists uh, talking uh, about their field work in indigenous communities, um, traditional medicine combined with Western medicine. Um, then <clears throat> Reza um, uh, spearheaded uh, organizing our session on surgery and culture. Uh, with uh, many of his colleagues uh, who uh, work uh, overseas, as does he, uh, uh, humanitarians, uh, people who transform lives on a daily basis and, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the impact of that carries forward uh, for uh, decades and then generations. And, um, uh, and uh, so that um, was very rewarding. And then uh, lastly, last year, we then brought it back to the community, inviting NGOs, uh, Mayan families, who um, Reza pointed out, um, who we've worked with building the stoves. Uh, the, the directors of that um, came and spoke with us, along with lawyers and um, anthropologists. So um, to kind of conclude my portion, um, I think that Reza, um, 
uh, very eloquently um, uh, um, described um, the, um, the extraordinary um, opportunity that we've had to work together and um, what we are calling kind of a novel approach, which is uh, surgical anthropology. I was trained as a medical anthropologist here at UCLA. Um, uh, Susan Scrimshaw, uh, my dear uh, mentor and uh, uh, colleague, uh, was my chair of my committee. And um, many of my uh, mentors um, still are in the Los Angeles area. I'm very delighted to have with us in the audience today uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Linda Garo, who's in the anthropology department. We're very happy to have you here. She's also the president of the Society for Medical Anthropology. And um, along with um, uh, others who are um, involved, not only locally, but nationally. And so this um, effort that we've engaged in to kind of um, uh, move uh, the um, work of anthropologists beyond just medical anthropology to surgical anthropology I think has a lot of potential uh, for the future and um, coupled with um, our um, awareness that we want to understand the stories of those patients not only in the operating room in the waiting room as Reza showed but also what happens when that child when uh, Gabriel goes back to his community and then now is going to work with this woman who's a traditional healer in her community um, and uh, who will be consulted with um, in terms of what to do about diet after the surgery, um, who may also work with a local midwife when the next child's born and who are the ones on the front line there. So uh, we thank you very much for engaging in this um, crossroads effort with us. Um, it's uh, been very meaningful the last couple of years and uh, when we think about everybody asks well what what are next steps for us and so beyond the crossroads um, our uh, goal and hope is to continue uh, with uh, ongoing student faculty engagement, uh, develop uh, uh, a course on surgical anthropology uh, with humanitarian focus as well as continue this symposium series in one form or another um, and uh, potentially develop community field programs and projects which build on the interests of students um, and um, continue of course in our academic world to present uh, conferences, develop papers and um, hopefully uh, have the chance to do some comparative work um, uh, in uh, maybe Ecuador, um, maybe Brazil, uh, and uh, if not also, uh, or and also potentially even in the United States because Los Angeles certainly is a global community. <clears throat> so now I'd like to transition to um, letting you know what you have in store for the rest of the morning. And um, the um, three H's um, I think sum up um, uh, what you're going to hear about and the people who are going to tell their stories. Um, uh, when I was um, finishing typing up the program, I was actually overwhelmed with um, the um, extraordinary work that uh, the people you're going to hear from today are engaged in. Um, and what I think has been most remarkable about the participants is that they live and breathe this sense of humility. Um, and they put people first. Um, as Reza said, they have to, of course, know what the diagnosis is, know what the treatment plan is, but they don't forget that that is a human being there. And so the rest of us are inclined to see them as heroes, right? Um, uh, and in a certain way, I think they are, um, because they are, uh, like the shamans that I've devoted much of my life to study in traditional societies. They're the movers and the shakers, as uh, Eliada referred to them as the psychopump, as the individuals who have a vision to know how to go beyond the place that we're in, even uh, in a very micro way, whether it's how to take this part of the lip and pull it with this part of the lip, or how to transform a heart, whether it's with surgery, or how to provide care to children 
who are um, suffering from non-communicable diseases. Because this century, we're going to see uh, a surge, and we are already seeing a surge in problems like type 1 diabetes that Dr. Nick Cutris focuses on, and how to provide care um, in a heroic fashion, if you will, along with those who have the potential to um, make it happen, be they um, uh, the billionaires of the world, the millionaires, or the humble people in communities that we all um, go to see. And so um, I, uh, 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 I'm now going to um, uh, move towards introducing our uh, first speaker of the morning and um, uh, say that um, the ongoing lessons that remain to be learned are uh, profound and um, they will begin today with hearing from Dr. Nick Cutris. I want to um, take a few minutes to tell you about uh, Nick because um, I have teenagers I uh, have twins um, who are um, heading off to college next year. And, um, and um, uh, so I have a sense of that age range. And when I first met Nick and heard that at the age of 14, he went to Ecuador and traveled and uh, wasn't just there to hang out and have fun, so to speak. Well, maybe he was initially. He can tell that side of the story. Um, but he, um, he, he uh, met a family who had a child with type 1 diabetes. And he didn't just say, oh, that's sad. That's, that's a shame. Um, uh, he went home after seeing that this family had um, some access to insulin and care but lacked education about how to take care of the disease and also the extraordinary uh, response that families and parents were going to have to, to make to, to, um, to engage in, in, um, in really comprehensively caring for a child with such needs. He went back to um, Washington and, um, and um, flash forward you know, 10 and now 20 years later, um, uh, uh, started an organization, uh, American Youth Understanding Diabetes Abroad, AYUDA, which, um, which um, he's going to talk about today. Um, he's uh, 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 finishing up his um, fellowship in pediatric endocrinology in Miami. He uh, was a resident, correct, at um, Harbor UCLA. Uh, so um, we can also uh, be proud of his engagement here in Southern California. And so I'm delighted to have you back here in Los Angeles. It's an honor to have you be part of our symposium. So thank you, Dr. Kutchis. All right, well, thank you, uh, Bonnie, and the um, the organizing group here for um, for inviting me. It's a um, it's nice to be back uh, here and a, a privilege to um, and humbling to to be invited. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, my journey, uh, how I got uh, to where I am today, um, and I'll tell you I started off wanting to become a doctor, um, always wanted to go to med medical school, don't really know why. And then once I started working with kids with diabetes, I realized there's only so much a doctor can do. And that kind of pushed me on the, the public health spectrum. And now I kind of go back and forth. But the, the, the reason um, uh, you know, that happened is really this, this humanism of, of if you're going to be working with kids, in my case, with diabetes or any other condition, you know, really, what's the role of the healthcare professional, doctor, nurse, whatever you know may be? Is it to cure, to give medic, give medication, um, uh, or is there, uh, at the end of the day, is you know looking at what what the outcome is? Is really saving lives, or is it also in, enhancing um, people to live healthy, happy, productive lives? Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit um, about sorry, this uh, formatting got a little. Uh, uh, out of order. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my story in Ecuador. I'm going to give you a little context of, uh, about, uh, about diabetes historically to really better understand Ayuda's approach. And then I'm going to um, 
uh, talk a little bit more uh, just briefly about some service-based lo um, learning opportunities that students here at UCLA have participated in and other universities. And really that concept of, uh, of, of, of training um, and identifying global citizens. Um, so um, Jose Gabriel um, has type 1 diabetes. Uh, he was diagnosed in the early 80s in Ecuador when he was six months old. Um, Jose came from a middle to upper class family. Both his parents were physicians in Ecuador. They weren't the specialists who take care of diabetes, but they were, they were physicians. Um, and then the, the one endocrinologist um, in Quito, this is the picture of, of Quito here, uh, told Jose's parents, uh, your son's got diabetes, is an expensive disease, but you know, you all are doctors, so as long as you can afford the insulin, um, you know, Jose will be fine. Uh, fast forward six years later, Jose ends up in another coma. The parents are, uh, you know, w spending all their money on making sure Jose has all the, the stuff to manage the diabetes. Um, and then through some lucky uh, connections, uh, my best friend growing up, Jesse, uh, who started Ayuda with me, it turned out that Jesse's um, nanny was Jose Gabriel's grandmother. And so we coordinated to, to get him to, uh, to the States. We were in DC. Um, he got help from some colleagues at the National Institute of Health. And his, doctor, his parents, being doctors, were thinking there's got to be some, something else explaining why Jose's diabetes is out of control. He's got to have some special form of, of diabetes, something that doesn't make sense. So let's really try to figure this out medically. So all these tests get run. Um, the diagnosis comes back. It's just a lack of, lack of education is just as dangerous as a lack of insulin. And here it was, middle class family, both parents were doctors, didn't know the first thing about managing diabetes. So I got to know Jose over the years. He kept coming back to the US. He went to school with us. Um, and he had all this stuff to manage his diabetes. Yet his diabetes was, was kind of out of control, as, as, as kind of doctors would say. Um, so there was obviously more to diabetes than just having this stuff. Um, so I used, so it came to going uh, in high school, um, have to go uh, either go back to kind of the, the spoiled summer camp that I used to go to or you go do something else. And so uh, Jesse's family was going to, uh, to Ecuador, so I came along with them and we went to just kind of live with Jose Gab Gabriel's family and really understand what diabetes was. And um, we decided, oh, let's go to Ecuador. We'll help other kids with diabetes. No idea what diabetes was. Um, uh, but we ended up writing a workbook for kids with diabetes by youth, uh, uh, for youth. Um, and when we got to uh, Ecuador, there was no kind of uh, free support group for parents or children living with, with uh, type 1 diabetes. Um, and so it was kind of doctor's private practices. Um, and we're kind of, didn't really, the, the concept of a support group, parents um, sharing each other's uh, information and, and this concept that pe people aren't alone anymore with the same condition um, really wasn't there. Um, and so this is a, a picture of, of Jesse and I getting ready to meet with the First Lady of, of, of Ecuador. Um, back then there was no coverage for, um, uh, for children living with diabetes uh, with insulin. and so. Uh, here it was, these 15 years old at the time, these neutral agents of change coming in and we can get appointments to, to, to see the, the first lady and the, and the president. Um, um, and not because of us, but now 20 years later, the Ecuadorian government um, does provide um, does insulin um, uh, for kids. Um, so when we were in, so we were in Ecuador, there was a, a couple things that were pretty powerful, impactful in my life, and then and also in 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 Ayuda. And it was, you know, a lack of education can just be as dangerous as a lack of um, uh, of insulin. And then these youth can be agents of change for other youth. So here it was, these doctors getting up to talk to the kids with diabetes, and the kids are in outer space. And then all of a sudden, uh, these two kids who had no idea what they were talking about start talking and these kids are, are listening. Um, and so that was pretty impactful. And then this concept of going abroad of understanding is just as important as doing, maybe even more important than actually doing. Um, 
So we went to, after we got back from Ecuador, we were like, wow, uh, there's a need there. We had no idea what we want. You know, we didn't set out this, to start an organization. Um, we were too young to be on a board of an organization. Um, and so we found our parents' friends to be on the board, and um, we started this, or, this, this organization called Ayuda. Um, but, and then we started to travel around Latin America, see other examples of, of what was going on with, with diabetes. Um, we got invited to go to Croatia, other, um, other places around the world, Belize. Um, and then what we started to do is we had really no, no idea what we were doing, but we were just kind of seeing examples of what was happening in other countries and sharing best practices with each, with each other. So this Campo Amigo um, was actually a diabetes camp that was started in, in Monterrey, Mexico by um, Lady Maria de Alba, who has type 1 diabetes herself. And so Jesse and I went to go visit a, a camp in, uh, in Monterrey and then some camps in the U.S. and kind of came up with some, some best practices to, to share with, uh, with other youth. Uh, around the world. And then so what was pretty um, kind of what IUD is all about is, is empowerment. And so this says, this is a ch child with type 1 diabetes. This says, mi primero pinchazo solo, my first injection by myself. So it wasn't a doctor or a nurse educator teaching um, Martin to give an injection. It was the other five-year-old sitting around in a circle giving themselves injections, and Martin says, I want to do it too. Okay. So, um, you know, Ayuda, we're about empowering youth to serve as agents of change in diabetes communities around the world. We work with local partners to kind of strengthen the infrastructure there with, um, by promoting youth leadership. Um, we empower passionate youth students to become leaders of social change by placing them in these, in these um, diabetes communities. At the end of the day, we want our volunteers to motivate other youth to lead happy and healthy lives with, with diabetes. Um, so today we've placed about 450 volunteers abroad um, in 20 different countries. Um, currently, we primarily have uh, programs in Dominican Republic, Ecuador, um, and Haiti. Um, and we're also based out of Ashoka. I don't know if, uh, if you, I'll speak a little bit more about that in a little bit um, in DC with our, with our staff. Um, so I don't want to bore you too much, but I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes talking about diabetes to, so you can really get the, a little context of, um, of, of humanism with, with diabetes as it relates to, to Latin America. Um, so, First, reality check, diabetes is a, main, a big issue here in, in the U.S. And so you don't have to go abroad to make a difference. There's plenty you can do here. Um, so, you know, my philosophy, if you're, if you're going to go abroad, let's try to figure out how to do it in a, in a comprehensive manner and kind of understanding the, the culture and, and working in partnership, um, uh, as Reza said, with these communities, when you go home, who's going to be there to, to kind of continue your, your work? So diabetes is an epidemic. As, um, you know, as you heard in, in Ecuador, diabetes is on the rise. It's on the rise all around the world. So by the year um, 2030, close to 600 million people are going to have uh, diabetes. So as you can see, more, more people, more diabetes. So you see India, China, U.S. are the top three in terms of uh, prevalence of, uh, of diabetes. Okay, so there's two types of diabetes. In general, um, about type 2 is about 10% of the population, and of that, about 10% has type 1 diabetes. But both type 1 and type 2 are rising in every country. Unfortunately, 80% of people with diabetes live in low- and middle-income countries, which, which makes it that much more challenging. Okay, and all, close to 80,000 children every year develop type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes in the U.S. is the second most common chronic condition after asthma. So one in every 300 kids under um, uh, 18 years of age have type 1 diabetes. So most likely if your kids are in school or you're in school, um, you know someone with type 1. Anybody in this room have diabetes? Anybody in this room have a, a sibling or a family member with, with diabetes? Okay. Um, so if you kind of look at the global pediatric diabetes population, type 1 kind of stands out, and there's definitely unmet needs of, of this community. And then there's this type 2 kids, obesity, and other things that are just 
we, we can barely deal with type 1 globally, and there's this type 2 epidemic just waiting to, uh, uh, to sink us. Okay. So this is a picture of a, um, two pictures of children with diabetes uh, about 100 years ago. So the treatment of diabetes before insulin was starvation. So kids usually succumb to death within weeks to, to months. Okay. And then in 1922, the discovery of, in, of, of insulin happens. Okay. So this is a child in December 15, 1922. He received insulin. This is him two months later. Okay, so insulin really was uh, a miracle. So basically, normally what our body does, our liver makes some, uh, gives us energy, gives us some um, uh, energy, and our pancreas makes insulin to counter it. So we have this kind of normal basal insulin. And every time we eat, our pancreas puts out some more insulin to cover the, the carbohydrates. So back 100 years ago, when they came up with insulin, you see the, the top slide, the normal insulin secretion. You have what your body normally does, and then you just get a, a shot below that doesn't really mimic the physiology of, of what our body usually does, but it's, you know, comes close, right? So in the 1940s, they saw insulin as, like a, as a cure, but then what happened is that people with diabetes started dying earlier than other, uh, than other people. Um, uh, I was speaking last night with somebody there whose father has type 1 diabetes, you know, died prematurely at, at 50 years of age from, from a heart attack because there's more to, to diabetes than, than just insulin. It's, it's the kind of fine tuning um, of it. So it really became clear um, that, that you need more than just insulin um, to, cure, to kind of manage di diabetes. So diabetes is the number one cost of, of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 attribute to blindness. It's the number one cause of end-stage renal disease, number one cause of amputations, and you're going to have uh, uh, two to six times increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So you saw the, the slide from Ecuador of, of hypertension, also an issue. Well, diabetes also contributes to that and, and premature death. So this is kind of what the treatment of diabetes was in, in, the, in the 70s. You get an injection a day, you have this fixed meal plan, you're testing your sugar by looking at your urine, um, and we've come a long way since. And then in the early 80s, this invention of, of home glucose monitoring came, came about. And then, they, and then when you could then test your blood sugar at home, you didn't have to go to the doctor's office. Then some people started to say, wow, there's this, maybe there's people can do this without a doctor, with a doctor supervising. So this whole concept of, of patient empowerment came, um, came up and teaching people how to uh, manage their diabetes at home. And when talking about diabetes, there's all this, this hemoglobin A1C. And I'm going to show you some outcome data, so I'm just going to try to explain this. But you basically have an average blood, uh, blood sugar over three months. That's, that's your A1C. And so as you see here, an A1C of 7 would cor correspond to an average blue blood sugar of 150. And so we know every time you can re um, reduce that A1C, your risk of complications uh, decreases. So this shows like you're going from a, an A1C of 11, your relative risk of diabetes complications close to 12, you reduce the A1C to, uh, to 8 complications risk, risk decreases uh, pretty dramatically. Okay. So there was a landmark study in, in the 80s looking at intensive diabetes control. And the take-home points from that are the more you check your blood sugar, the more likely you are to have lower A1Cs. You're giving yourself multiple injections a day. You have a nutrition plan. You have a nutrition plan. You have an exercise plan. You have monthly visits with a team that's not just doctors, but it's educators, nutritionists. There's a whole psychosocial component of, uh, of diabetes. Um, so there's this real complexity of, of it. And why do we do that? You know, what are we trying to prevent? Obviously, death, complications, severe low blood sugars. Uh, but then, what I want to ask, you know, really, with diabetes communities abroad, wh what should we really be trying to preserve? You know, life, happiness, productivity. And so, while insulin's important, it's not the only answer. Um, so. 
I'm going to read this. This is a, a, one of our volunteers who describes what, what diabetes is, is like. So since the age of eight, when I was diagnosed with diabetes, I've had to make dramatic changes in my life. Whenever I look at food, I don't see food. I also see numbers. And then I have to do math. I have to count how many carbohydrates I eat and give myself the required amount of insulin. Whenever I go do an activity, I need to make sure my glucose level is okay. I don't want to go low in the middle of a swim race. These are some of the little things that diabetes do, diabetics do every day. Maybe you have seen me do them, maybe not. Uh, I've been fortunate to grow up in Canada where I was taught uh, that doing these small steps can make a huge difference in my long-term health. However, this diabetes education is not available everywhere. Um, so with diabetes, this you know, fine balance of, of goals. So you want to have the kind of best blood sugars possible. Uh, and let's not forget blood pressure and, and cholesterol well. You want to have as few uh, uncomfortable low blood sugars as well. And don't forget, let's have a life as well. So this can be tough. Okay? It's not impossible, but it's tough. So someone with diabetes should really goes, goes to the, the doctor about every uh, uh, three to four months, say four hours um, a year. Okay? They're at home alone 8,756 hours. Okay. So someone with diabetes, which is a 24-hour-7 condition, needs to know how to do this without, without the healthcare professional. Okay. And so we say diabetes, I don't like calling it disease. It's a condition. It's something you, li you live with and you manage 24-7. Um, uh, poor diabetes control can lead to complications. Someone with, diabetes, someone with diabetes doesn't lead, you know, lead to anything. Um, it's poor control of, uh, of diabetes, and, 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 and so one of the things we try to help with these stereotypes in other countries is that people with diabetes are not sick, right? So when diabetes gets uncontrolled, then, then you can get sick. So this is to uh, show you how we're doing in the U.S. So in the U.S., this was a study looking at over 25,000 people with type 1 diabetes at the top diabetes centers in, in the U.S. Okay, this is just different age groups, basically all, all, uh, all around. Only 25% of patients are meeting the recommended uh, clinical guidelines of, of acceptable hemoglobin A1Cs. So we're failing here. 75% of patients are, are meeting goals. So you could say, well, patients are non-compliant, or you could say the system's failing. I prefer the latter. Um, but this is also something interesting from the study. This just shows um, hemoglobin A1Cs and, the, and how much you test your blood sugar. So the more you test your blood sugar, the lower the, your A1C is on average. To me, this is just common sense. The more you test, the more opportunity you have, the more likely you are for, for success in anything that you do in life, and diabetes isn't any different. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, IUTA's approach. And so what we do is our service delivery, our, our, our volunteers, students um, who are trained to go abroad. Um, uh, we have, uh, from high school to graduate students, about 30 to 40 percent are high school, about 30 percent college, and the rest are, are, are graduate students. About 50 percent have diabetes, 50 percent don't have diabetes. Some speak the language or fluent. Some need a little work, but it's more about the, the motivation um, component. Um, and there's the, in, at the end of the day, with diabetes, there's some kind of key ingredients that, uh, that we work with. Motivation, leadership skills, um, uh, education, efficient use of resources, youth uh, participation, and civic engagement. And those are, at the end of the day, that's kind of what we think will lead to uh, living happier and healthier lives. Um, so I'm going to walk through some of these and tell some stories about some, um, uh, some elements of, of this project. Um, so we'll speak a little bit about local partnerships, how we, uh, who we work with in different countries, uh, the leadership training, local diabetes projects, diabetes outreach, and, and sustainability. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and, and Haiti. Um, and just remember, diabetes, it's complexity. Um, and so we, it's a uh, comprehensive approach is required, but also a locally appropriate one. Uh, this is an article that came out of the New York Times uh, on World Diabetes Day, November 14th, about some international doctors who, who wrote this article who were living in Haiti um, 
who brought up the issue of uh, a, a child who presented at the hospital who died um, from uh, complications of high blood sugar uh, from diabetic ketoacidosis, um, and brought up the, the issue that they didn't, there was lack of access to strips, which was a, a great point to bring up because there's always this focus on insulin. Um, but that's on the surface. If you dig deeper, this child was sick for over three days um, with fever and other things going on. And if this family had the education or the resources or the knowledge to know that there's a, someone out in their own country looking out for them to call if they get sick and get advice of what to do, this child wouldn't have, wouldn't have died. Um, and so these, these kids uh, and families really need a, a backbone throughout the year, a support group who's there for them. So there's some considerations that Uta goes through in terms of figuring out who we're going to partner with. This is an organization in Ecuador, the Fundación Diabetes Juvenil Ecuador. Uh, it was started in 2004 by parents of kids with diabetes, uh, and it was a result of um, um, the camp program in, in Ecuador. Finally, the parents got together and started a, a group, uh, an organization that has its own office, full-time staff, that's run throughout the year and provides year-round uh, support services. Um, and Ayuda works with them on, 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 on different levels. Uh, this is in Dominican Republic, Aprendino Vivir, another um, um, uh, uh, organization that's run um, by someone with uh, type 1 diabetes himself, by, a, as Bonnie said, a, a mover shaker. Um, and this is an example of, of kids, where we, we did, uh, looked at kids who come to the, the Aprendino Vivir in Dominican Republic <coughs> before um, kind of their baseline, what it is. So they're, uh, all the kids had hemoglobin A1Cs, you know, way over the recommended um, level. Um, so um, kind of blood sugar is over, over 300 when the recommended is less than 150. Um, I just got back from Haiti two days ago. Um, we're doing a, um, uh, um, a volunteer program there, just completed a pilot program with a, um, a foundation there that's been around for the past uh, almost 30 years. Um, this is their building, Fadimak. The uh, surrounding buildings uh, had crumbled in the earthquake, but um, their uh, organization uh, buildings uh, stood strong. And so in Haiti, where um, there's governmental programs for, for children, less than five years, at, they just don't have the money to support and maintain health care for, for, for children over, over five. Um, if you look at kids uh, less than um, five years old, 40% are malnourished, and malnourishment contributes to about 60% of, of, of deaths. Um, and then prevalence of diabetes is higher in kids who are malnourished. So, you know, after s surviving childhood uh, disease, if a child develops diabetes, uh, he's alone, and if he survives, you know, he's lucky, but just for how long? Um, so the foundation we work with in Haiti they're this, you know, the, these kids who I saw in Haiti, they're more, they're lucky to have diabetes because the, the foundation there provides these services, nutrition, civic engagement throughout the years that a lot of these other children in Haiti, don't, you know, don't have. Uh, another thing we focus on is leadership training. Um, so our volunteers, before going abroad, they're required to participate in a semester-long uh, online course and then a, a training summit uh, in, in D.C. So uh, we focus on principles of IUTA, social entrepreneurship and fundraising, cultural training, diabetes and NCDs, and then leadership and mentorship. Um, so Ashoka is where uh, we're based out of and um, uh, kind of social entrepreneurship, if you don't, it's kind of one of the things we try to get our volunteers and, and students to, to recognize is that they are a social entrepreneur, that it, they are a change maker. And so the social entrepreneurism is, I, I, I think Bill Drayden sums it up pretty well. And what he says is social, social entrepreneurs are not just content to give, a fi, to give somebody a fish or teach them to fish. Uh, they will not rest until they have revolutionized the, the fishing industry. So we try to attract uh, like-minded individuals to, uh, to IUTA um, and kind of through the IUTA experience, through working with diabetes, really uh, get them to appreciate that they're a change maker and whether they go into diabetes or something else, um, that they will help revolutionize whatever industry that, they, um, that they're so passionate about. 
Uh, there's also a cultural training uh, component. Um, some students come down early and do additional language training. Uh, and then, uh, in parallel with our leadership training, our, our volunteers also work with the local youth leaders and, and engage them and get them to kind of uh, uh, be active. Um, and they, the local leaders, they'll go around and do site visits and community things. They organize concerts. Um, this is a, a program we facilitated between Haiti and Dominican Republic. So local youth leaders with diabetes from Dominican Republic went to go see the diabetes camp in Haiti. And likewise, um, people in Haiti went uh, next door and observed the, the camp in, um, 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 uh, in Dominican Republic. And people in Ecuador going to, in, to uh, Colombia, people in Ecuador going to Brazil, Brazil coming to Ecuador. Um, this is an example of in, in Haiti, one of the youth leaders with diabetes, he's the one going out and doing the screening projects. Um, and then we're also about in, investing in, in systematic change. So this is Guido and Maria Fernanda. They both have type 1 diabetes in Ecuador in 1999. Um, that was Guido and Maria Fernanda's um, first uh, diabetes camp experience. Um, this is Guido in the middle of the picture uh, two years ago, um, and now he's a medical student, um, just did a rotation in my hospital uh, in pediatric endocrinology, and he was also the keynote speaker at an NCD child uh, conference um, the other year in, in, in Oakland. Um, and so giving, giving people with diabetes um, this kind of hope, motivation, uh, and then uh, once again, they'll, they'll become those, those, those change makers um, once, once they mature. This is Claudia. Um, she's a, a, a youth leader in the Dominican Republic. Um, she got active um, in the Prenido Vivir services in 2008. Um, this is her, and she gave me permission to show you this. Uh, this is her kind of report um, before she got involved with the camp. So her hemoglobin A1C was 12.9. So remember this um, uh, graph I showed you? So she would be in the red range, out of control, right? And then this is her hemoglobin A1C um, this year, 6.5, so in control. Uh, so local projects. This is an example of, uh, this is a local, local projects or things that are kind of our volunteers will engage in. So this is a, um, a 5K, 10K, Zumbathon uh, in Dominican Republic uh, that will be happening next month um, that our volunteers also collaborate with the, the organization with. This is one of our volunteers who has type 1 diabetes who, and uh, uh, someone with the Dominican Republic with type 1 diabetes is doing, the, doing a first with diabetes. So he's running a 10K and, and, and learning how to balance and manage his diabetes. So Campo Amigo is kind of the, the, uh, the bread and butter of, of what Ayuda has uh, been doing in trying to create um, hope and motivation. Um, it's a fun, safe, educationally empowering environment um, that enables people to live happy and healthier lives. And every country has their, some countries have camps, some don't. So it's not Ayuda's camp, but Ayuda goes and um, uh, helps these local uh, groups carry out the camp with our, with our volunteers. And this is just to give you an idea of, of what camp's about. Um, you know, there's exercise, there's arts and crafts, there's education, or what we call like dynamic act activities. Um, who wants to go to education class, right? Um, there's nutrition, teachable moments, long-lasting relationships. Obviously, there's fun. This is a, a game of uh, people uh, eating blindfolded. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's leadership and life skills uh, to manage diabetes. Um, so the, the Campo Amigo program in Ecuador has um, uh, been recognized. Um, so some of the, the studies that uh, we looked at is kind of what's the role of, of camp in, in, in kind of the short-term short outcomes. So this was data from 2005. It looked at the adolescent, you could see the adolescent groups, hemoglobin A1C improved three months after camp. So in the short term, uh, it improved. But if you looked at the younger age groups, it didn't really improve. 
So what did the foundation in, in Ecuador do? They decided, oh, we got to educate the parents. So then the following year, we did the same follow-up, and look, there was improvements in A1C in the younger kids uh, just, as, just as much as, as, the, as the older kids. So really integrating the, the, the families um, into the curriculum was, was essential. Uh, this is like a busy slide with lines, but this, this is just really the effect of, of camp and year-round support services to the people kind of, quote, out of control. And so this is looking at people who attended camp or were engaged with the foundation in Ecuador for more three years consecutively. So you have people starting off with A1Cs like way up, and you can see how they're trending, how they trend down. And so maybe they're not less than seven, but remember, uh, in terms of risk reduction, every 1% decrease, we're reducing the, the, the risks of, of complications by 40%. Okay. And then this, is, then this is looking at, on the, on the long term, what does camp and kind of continual engagement with a local organization do? Um, so the recommended guidelines for A1Cs is, is less than seven. You can see the baseline, people have an A1C on average higher than that. And then after two years of engagement, A1Cs are, um, uh, show a drop and, uh, um, and actually are better than a lot of the data here in the U.S. Um, so the difference, what, what is, what's camp all, you know, just to kind of visualize it better, this is a child uh, before, in Bolivia actually, before he got connected to the, uh, a local partner organization there. Um, this is him three months later, okay? Similar to the, the picture I showed you with the discovery of insulin, but just a lack of education can kind of have the same effect is a lack of insulin. And then our volunteers engage in, in outreach. Um, and so managing diabetes in resource poor settings, there's kind of, there's a different approach to it as well. This is a picture of um, uh, one of our, our staff teaching other volunteers how to test urine. Um, and so it's, it's not so, it's, it's about how do, how do you be efficient with the current resources uh, uh, that you have. So if you're gonna uh, spend a dollar on testing your blood sugar, when you should be testing your blood sugars six times a day, and a lot of these people, families live on less than one dollar a day. So if you're gonna use that one dollar, you better know what to do with that information. Um, so there's a, a lot of focus on insulin. This is on average how much it costs to manage diabetes per year, okay? over $4,000, and this is a, a, a low ball, but this is complete direct cost. So there's a, fa there's a focus on insulin, but if you actually look at it in terms of following recommendations, it's actually blood glucose test strips that are the most expensive. Um, this is some data that came out in the uh, early 2000s on, uh, in Ecuador. Um, and so the studies from the uh, PAHO World Health Organization estimated the cost of diabetes being about $900, but I just showed you it's close to 4000 So this doesn't really incorporate what it should cost to manage diabetes correctly. So there's this kind of dichotomy um, where, oh, just the uh, low middle income countries developing world, let's get them a one test strip a day um, and get them a couple types of insulin, but I have, a, I have an ethical issue with that, and, and, and how, do you, how do you, if you're going to be working in these countries, how do you do it in a comprehensive approach, doing it to the, to the gold standard of treatment and, uh, and a reality? So a comprehensive approach example, um, where people with the foundation, there's mandatory visits, uh, kind of sponsorships to see an endocrinologist. They have A1Cs every three months. They get supports like, uh, and, and free um, supplies from the local organization, and we have other partnerships with other NGOs internationally that might get them the insulin and supplies. Uh, this is a outreach program in, um, uh, in one of the poorest provinces of Ecuador on the, uh, on the coast. Uh, this is Yanni, he's six years old with diabetes. Um, you can see on the uh, left-hand side, um, was malnourished, poor nutrition, and then after being integrated into camp and into, integrated into the foundation, um, had improved growth, look at the smile on his face, and also improved diabetes control. Um, this is Joanna, this is her home. She doesn't have a refrigerator, buries her insulin in the, uh, under the ground to keep it cool. Um, 
yet she learned how to uh, give herself multiple injections a day, how to count carbohydrates, and so this whole philosophy, oh, you're poor, you, don't, you can't learn how to do it, is, 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 is incorrect. Uh, and then there's a component of, of program sustainability. Um, so what I, we integrate our volunteers into the leadership um, structure, our volunteers fundraise, um, and we teach them how to be social entrepreneurs or realize that they're social entrepreneurs, and then this whole partnership and, and linkages. Uh, and so kind of a, our, our business model is really uh, having the volunteers go out and, and fundraise and be advocates and teaching um, their constituents about the, uh, the obstacles that people living with diabetes face uh, in other countries as well. Um, and so yes, we get um, uh, corporate donations, foundation um, donations, but the, the, the real core um, is our volunteers going out and, and fundraising on their own. And it, and it really puts an awesome responsibility on our volunteers and our students. So you take one, someone here at UCLA, a graduate student, undergraduate student, um, and kind of you know, the, teaching them how to advocate for their cause. It's something that's really not taught, wasn't taught to me. Uh, in school, wasn't taught to me in, in school of public health or medicine, and so how do we give some kind of practical skills uh, to our students um, um, uh, and teach them about things other than, and than NIH grants. Um, and so our volunteers, they, they fundraise, they, depending on the program, the duration of it, there's a, a pre-fundraising re requirement and then a post-program program following up and, and um, telling your, your supporters what you did, doing the Facebooks, doing the tweets, um, et cetera. Um, and then we, don't, we also don't believe you should have to pay to volunteer. And so what their volunteers fundraise kind of covers their expenses uh, as well. Um, so, yes, Ayuda helps kids living with diabetes, but it's also more than that, uh, and it's also realizing that um, you can uh, kind of do good and have fun at the same time, and it's also about helping yourself. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, may, our, our volunteers are maybe even getting more out of it than the kids that they're, they're helping of this kind of internal growing uh, uh, experience. And this is Julie, one of our volunteers. So. This is um, something she wrote to me after her first experience volunteering with us in Ecuador in, in 2005. I'm just gonna blow it up. So on a personal, and Julie has type one diabetes and grew up in New Orleans. Uh, on a personal note, I just wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity. One of the best moments for me was on the bus on the way back to Quito from pre-camp. I realized that for the past five years of my life, I wasn't accepting that I have diabetes. I obviously accepted it in the way that I, quote, controlled it and managed it, but not in the way of actually having diabetes. It was like being in mourning after death of someone close to you, and then that day comes when you realize you can't mourn anymore and the burden is lifted off your shoulders. I felt that way on the bus, and now I accepted it like I didn't know I hadn't. Without this past month, past month I'm not sure if I would have ever come to that realization. Thank you. So it took the, uh, the, the, uh, the teens with diabetes in Ecuador, who we were going there to help to wake Julie up from, from her morning. Um, and so once again, there's, there's, some th there's some elements of programs that IUTA supports, um, local diabetes projects with, uh, with our programs, but then there's year-round year activities that are carried out by our local partners with hopefully life-lasting life effects. Um, and so in terms of doing stuff um, for your students or students who are here now or, or are watching, if you're interested in kind of using diabetes as, a, as an example of this experiential learning, um, uh, you, you can. Uh, we usually uh, accept and train about 50 vol uh, volunteer students per year. Uh, we just had our first program of the year in Haiti. There's one coming up in, two coming up in Dominican Republic in, in May and June, and then another one um, in November. And you can always check the website for more listing, iudink.net, for uh, listings of, of volunteer programs. Um, and so you don't have to be a medical student. You don't have to be uh, necessarily fluent in the language. You don't have to have diabetes. We look for a, for a, for a diverse team. 
and then we provide training and support uh, as well. And then it's also a great um, opportunity for capstone field work uh, experience where hopefully it can be ongoing, continued engage over more than one year, finding faculty sponsors, either via, via me, Bonnie, um, others, um, and uh, see it as not just an education, but also a professional and personal um, uh, growth experience as well. Uh, and this is just a slide I usually leave with the, uh, with the volunteers, but this is the, the uh, speaking of kind of global citizens, this is the, the, the essence of what we try to get our, our volunteers to understand. Uh, go to the people, live with them, love them, start with what they know, build with what they have, but with the best leaders, when the work is done, the people will say, we've done it ourselves. So, thank you. <laughs>